A big decision for Des Moines voters. For the first time in 20 years, Iowa's largest city will have a new mayor. And these four people all want the job. KCCI is helping you decide who will get your vote. This is a KCCI Commitment 2023 special. The Des Moines mayoral debate starts right now. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Ben Kaplan. And I'm Stacy Horst. Over the next hour, we hope to answer the questions that you have so that you are informed when you go to the polls on November 7th. The winner will replace current mayor Frank County. He is not running for re-election. County is the city's longest serving mayor and has held the office since 2004. This mayoral election will be different from the last one. In 2020, the city council voted to adopt a winner take all system. That's after the 2019 mayoral race triggered a runoff election. This time around, the candidate that simply has the most votes on November 7th will be the winner. There'll be no runoff election. Before we get started, we want to take a moment to introduce you to the candidates running for mayor of Des Moines. And Connie Bozen is currently an at-large Des Moines City Council member. She has held that office since 2018. Bozen has also served on the Des Moines School Board. She is also a small business owner. Denver Foote is currently a hairdresser. They describe themselves as a community organizer and activist. Due to a scheduling conflict, Foote will not participate in today's debate. Josh Mandelbaum is currently a Des Moines City Council member representing Ward 3. He has held the office since 2018. Mandelbaum is an environmental attorney and has previously served as a policy advisor to former Governor Tom Vilsack. Christopher Von Arks works as a security guard. He's also a musician who plays with several bands. Now here are the rules for today's debate. Candidates will have 60 seconds to answer a question. We the moderators may interrupt a candidate if they go off topic or go over their allotted time. Moderators will also have the discretion to allow a candidate to respond if they are mentioned by another candidate. Okay, we're gonna get started. Our first question, what are your top priorities for the city? We drew names out of a hat to determine the order and Mr. Von Arks, you have 60 seconds. Well, my main priorities would be to lower property taxes because everything is way getting way too expensive in the city. It's it's getting to be more like Chicago or a bigger city like that. And however they're doing things in Chicago and L.A., New York, I, I want to try and do the opposite because it's getting way too expensive. It doesn't need to be. Uh, there's a homeless situation. that's become more of a crisis uh, that needs to be dealt with promptly. Um, there is there's stuff that's being taught to young children uh, and I think in the elementary school that I think that the parents should have a little bit more say and voice in what their kids are being taught. I think uh, I think there needs to be more of like a music scene so there's a lot of creative people in Des Moines with lots of talents not just music but art like painting and whatnot and I uh, zero okay all right thank you uh, uh, Mrs. Bozen you know have 60 seconds my main priorities are creating a safer Des Moines and that would be uh, support our first responders and our police officers with the tools they need and also to advance our meta our crisis team that are dealing with the mental health issues and accelerating growth of our economic development be open for business, roll out the red carpet and get new development coming into Des Moines, revitalizing our neighborhoods. We have had a couple of programs that have been very effective, Invest ESM, and I would continue investing in that and making sure that every neighborhood has the full potential and all the business nodes are being developed. I also would ensure that we don't leave anyone behind. And that would be, again, working with uh, programs like uh, we have with Polk County on a sobering center and a welcoming center that would address the needs for our immigrants and refugee families. All right, Mr. Mandelbaum, time's yours. This election's about our future and the future community that we want to build together. And my priority is to create a Des Moines that works better for everyone and provides an opportunity to everyone. And there's a lot of policy that goes into that. It's making sure we take care of basics like infrastructure and public safety, but thinking about how we can do them differently and better. For example, if we identify new dollars for public safety, we should spend that on mental health workers to respond to public safety calls the right way the first time. It's thinking about how we grow our community and build the workforce of the future at the same time. So we don't just build buildings, we invest in people and apprenticeship programs so we can continue building. It's about addressing housing, because if you can't meet, if you can't find the housing you need 
at a price you can afford, this community doesn't work for you. And it's about creating an accessible community where people are connected to jobs, to healthcare, to childcare and grocery stores, the basics that make life work, but also amenities that add to quality of life too. All right, thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Our next question, um, what would you do to make sure people feel safe in their neighborhoods? We begin with Mrs. Bozen. Again, we go back to, I think that we have seen an uptick in violence. First, we need to get to the root cause and what is causing that. But we also need to ensure that we have the coverage that we need. And one thing in the neighborhood, uh, even downtown as a neighborhood, I've proposed that we have a downtown corridor police force trained heavily in the mental health area, along with outreach workers and to support the people downtown. And I would also then look at our training and what we can do, and then also put programs for the youth. We see the uptick, we've seen it in youth violence, and what we need is create opportunities for our youth to see a different path. And given one thing that we did this summer was provide uh, job opportunities for youth. When I talked to a young man who had experienced that many of his friends had gone a different path than he had, he said it was because we were hungry and we needed uh, we needed money and we needed things. So I would uh, definitely, we gave job opportunities for Creative Visions, Oak Ridge, and uh, Boys and Girls Club. Giving kids opportunities, showing them there's a different path besides violence. How would you pay for the downtown corridor police force? I believe we would have to look at additional revenues and then some of that would be transfer dollars. I think we can also, within the revenues that we currently have, help uh, take some of the, into the more the mental health specialists. We have Lorna Garcia who's over that area now. We, uh, I advocated and was able to receive, uh, we were able to put in another police officer, and I think we need a more in, trained in the, in the mental health arena. And I think that we saw numerous calls being taken by our crisis advocacy team, and that defers calls that our police would have to take. All right, thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Mr. Mandelbaum, how do you make people feel safe in their neighborhoods? Yeah, it, that starts with supporting our first responders, our police and fire, who are core to providing public safety services in our community. Uh, and we need to support them and value the work that they do. Then we also need to look at how we can improve the way we provide public safety service. One of the first areas is we need more mental health and social workers responding to public safety calls. We know in communities that have implemented programs like this, there are communities in this country that are responding to almost 20% of their public safety calls with mental health workers and social workers. We've made improvements there, but we're not even responding to 1% of the calls for service that we get. And how do you pay for those additional people? Yeah, so one of the things that we know, uh, we have local option sales tax dollars that, that can help pay for mental health workers, but when we identify new dollars, we prioritize the mental health workers because that, in the places that have implemented it, has led to cost savings that allow investment uh, and allow refocusing of public safety resources on places that, that matter, the violent crime, domestic violence, where our police officers should be focused. All right, thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Mr. Van Arks, how do you make people feel safe? As, as mayor, what would your job be to do to make people feel safe in their neighborhoods? Well, first, tell everybody that there are crazy people in the world, but, but also to lower property taxes and lower taxes so that people will have more money so they won't resort to committing crimes. And a lot of these people who are committing crimes are generally not brilliant criminals. They're usually poorly educated. And the education system is just very terrible and it has been for a very long time. And that's why so many people are not making as much money as they very well should be. I think everybody should be very wealthy. And I think there's a reason why, and that's because there's something wrong with the education system. And a lot of people know this. All right, thank you, Mr. Von Arx. Uh, we're gonna stay on the topic of public safety. Uh, right now, po police department funding makes up about one third of the city's operating budget. Uh, what do you think about that amount? Uh, Mr. Mandelbaum, we'll start with you. Uh, so, I, and just for, Clarification and, and reference, the operating budget is just a portion of, of the city budget. You know, we spend, we have a road and capital infrastructure budget that is an even greater portion of the budget. Our operating budget pays for our personnel and our police department is our largest department. Uh, and it's a department that has operating costs. Every single one of those officers that's out on patrol has, uh, has a need for a vehicle, has a need for equipment. Um, and so, that is why it, 
it makes up a significant portion of our operating budget, and I think it is appropriate that, that our police department makes up a significant portion of our operating budget. To me, the most important question is, what do we do with new dollars if we have new dollars available? And if we have new public safety dollars available, we need to emphasize the mental health services because that's the biggest gap that I see in our public safety budget today. All right, Mr. Mandelbaum, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn it over now to Mr. Von Ox. Yes? Uh, uh, your answer, please, as to whether or not you think uh, that the, uh, the amount that the police department is funded is, is, is too much, is it enough, or I, should there be more? Well, I, I think uh, that the police are experts on whether they're getting enough or not. I've worked with a lot of policemen. I've, I've, I've worked with and met at least 30 of them, got to know them personally, and they are the, the, the greatest, most upstanding people I've ever met in my entire life. I will say they do a very good job. They, I would have to ask them personally what they would do, what they would like me to do about that. And I will do what, whatever they want me to do about that. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Bozen, your thoughts on the current funding for the police department? Well, again, a lot of the funding is made up of personnel, and I believe, if anything, we're probably short, especially in the mental health area. Uh, I know that we've been fortunate to work with Polk County and Broadlands, and they've been able to provide the mental health specialists, but I believe we need more. We were able to move to a 24-7 operation with mental health specialists, and it's made a world of difference. We also have embedded in our 911, uh, if there's a mental health call that comes in, that person determines do police and a mental health specialist crisis team go out, or can just the crisis team go out? And we need that to be 24-7. We also need more technology in our police department, so if anything, we can shift dollars within that to give them the tools so they can do the recording and keep the records that they haven't been able to do as well, and we're working on that. We are putting people embedded in the police department that are, run, that are the IT department will be embedded so that we will have a more complete documentation of reports and access to all those records that everybody's been asking for. So would it be a shifting of money or is more money needed? I think at this point, I think it could be reallocation, but in some cases, if we wanna really add more mental health specialists, I think we would need additional revenue. And as brought up, we do have sales tax revenue and it's our priorities. If we see a lot more calls going into that area, Sometimes that diverts, you could shift some of that over, but I think that we have to be aware that many of the calls they're taking on the mental health area are time consuming, and we really need to get people the help they need and not take them to jail because that's the only alternative. So I would be in favor of more allocation of that, getting more mental health workers. Thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Von Arks, our next question begins with you. What do you consider to be Des Moines' biggest and most urgent infrastructure needs? Um, the biggest, uh, most important in infrastructure needs? I think that uh, there's too many things that architects and building developers have to get permits for. Uh, I think there's too much red tape for new de development. I, I think that, you know, it's very hard for people to put up new buildings and to promote their business unless they have a lot, a lot of money. So like, you know, of course, like elite, big elite corporations, they have that kind of money, but people that are only making a million dollars a year or less, they, you know, it's going to be a little bit harder for them. Like a, a million dollars, making a million dollars a year is not the same thing as making a billion or two billion dollars a year. There's a big difference. Most entrepreneurs will make a million or around that, and that's not elite. Okay, thank you, Mr. Von Arks. Mrs. Bozen, what do you consider to be Des Moines' biggest and most urgent infrastructure needs? Well, if you talk to most of our residents, it would be our roads and improving the roads. Uh, most of the roads, we had a very poor rating on our roads. We've made significant strides with it when we passed the local option sales tax. But I hear that when I go door to door all the time about, can we get our road improved? Uh, that would be one, sidewalk gaps. We need to get our sidewalks filled, especially on school routes, and that's been our priority. And then our stormwater retention and work that we're doing. When we had the floods of 2018, we had severe damage throughout the city, and we have made great strides on that area too but it's very expensive and it's time consuming. Anybody that's 
driven down Ingersoll with sewer separation, storm sewer. If you've gone around the Beaverdale area, it is a massive infrastructure that is being done, but it's things that we need to do to make sure that our residents are safe and have the amenities that they want in the city. Any new needs or is it just upkeep of the current situation? Well, I think that we have had a lot of upkeep that we need, but I would say infrastructure as far as expanding our park system and improving all of our parks, uh, that's another area that we have high demand for. Uh, we also, you know, it's just the, all the things that we got behind on that we're playing catch up, but I think those are the main things that I would see. And Mr. Mandelbaum, what do you see as the biggest infrastructure needs, the most urgent needs for our city? We need to create an accessible community. And that starts with, with the basic pieces of infrastructure. Uh, that's our roads uh, and storm sewers. When, when I started on the council, only 23% of our roads were in good or excellent condition. We've been making record investment to improve our roads, but you don't get into a problem where only 23% of your roads are in good or excellent condition overnight, and you don't get out of it overnight either. But we, we need to think about our roads in a broader way than just that, right? We need infrastructure that is walkable, bikeable, transit accessible. And so as we make repairs and improvements to our roads, we need to do things like fill sidewalk gaps, design our streets so that they are safer for all users. And that has tremendous benefit. If someone can get someplace walking or biking, that's more customers for small businesses. That's a neighborhood that, that provides more access to amenities, the things you need to live. We need to invest in ways that, that provide that type of accessibility in our community. Uh, what about providing internet access for residents and making that affordable for, for folks who can't readily afford something like that? Yeah. Is, it, that, does that, is that included in infrastructure? I, that, that is included in infrastructure and uh, you know, certainly we need more competition and more internet access throughout our community. We, we saw the impacts of lack of internet access during the pandemic when students were, were being homeschooled uh, and, and had and the need for remote access. We've got companies, you know, Google Fiber is installing in parts of our community, MetroNet's installing, Mediacom is working, I think, to keep up their service. So we've got opportunities. We need to be mindful of where there are gaps and work to fill those gaps. Our library is an important, plays an important role in terms of access to that type of infrastructure as well. And we need to make sure that, that folks continue to have have access to good internet because that's the key to so much in our world today. All right, thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Okay, uh, Mrs. Bozen, we'll start this next topic uh, with you. Housing prices are rising around the country and here in Des Moines. Uh, what is your plan to make sure people have access to safe and affordable housing and how would you pay for it? Well, I think that's the ongoing thing. We all know there's cost pressures right now and salaries and that have not necessarily caught up with what the cost of housing is. So I think that working with our First of all, we have a lot of opportunity in Des Moines. We have a lot of lots that we could develop, and we work with various different groups, whether it be Habitat for Humanity, Home Inc., and various groups, and, and even our Invest DSM and different programs where we can go in and fix the homes that are currently in stock that are affordable. They just need to be updated. Uh, we have to be prepared that there is incentivization that goes along with that, and I know that there's big gaps, and as the cost of uh, building keeps going up, the gaps get wider. So the other thing that we need to ensure that if it is, even if it's affordable, we need to make sure it's safe, affordable housing. And we need to make sure that we're inspecting some of this, uh, especially rental property, that make sure that our people are living in good, safe conditions. But this is an ongoing thing that we need to really look at uh, holistically, bringing in all of the partners, even working with Polk County Housing Trust. We know there's a huge need and there's a missing gap. And when we are giving incentives for uh, apartment buildings and things like that, we are asking that a certain percentage be at a certain rate so that we can get more affordability built into every project that we help fund and give money for. If, if I'm watching this right now and I'm wondering what could be right around the corner for me because I'm struggling, is there anything that stands out to you that could be done immediately or soon that could help folks in a tough position? Well, I think if it's immediate, it's, gonna, it's difficult at that. But I think we do have in Des Moines a lot of housing stock that is affordable. We just need to build upon that. And we need to figure out how we can get developers to come in and say, we've got a lot of 40-foot lots. 
which means it's a smaller home probably that would be more affordable. And I think we really have to look at strategies because if it's immediate like today, it's, it's the cost of building is so high. So we need to look at everyone and bring it together because we know there's a shortage of affordable housing in this whole metro area. And I think the biggest thing is to incentivize the people and get them, get our lots filled that we have taken down homes that were blighted and we have done a major uh, program to get rid of some of those homes, which gives opportunity. So wherever I see an open lot means it's opportunity. How we afford, do affordable housing is how do we, what incentivizations do we have that we can provide that. But to get people to come into Des Moines, develop and provide those uh, programs. And again, with the apartment, we have a lot of programs. I know that we have a lot of apartments that are uh, I think uh, uh, my uh, time is up. Yes, I Sorry. think so. No, uh, thank you, though, uh, for answering the follow up question. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, now direct the same question to uh, Mr. Mandelbaum. Housing is a, a fundamental challenge. And if we if you can't find housing that meets your needs at a price you can afford, this community fundamentally doesn't work for you. That's why we need to build more housing of all types and at all price points. So no matter who you are or what stage in life you're at, you can find housing that meets your needs here in Des Moines. That means we have to be smart about how we use incentives. So anytime the city is providing incentives for a multifamily, uh, multifamily housing project, at least 20% of those units should be affordable. Uh, and we need to get the affordability level down to 60% area median income so that we're integrating affordable housing everywhere and not isolating it anywhere. We need to do things like look at our zoning code and look at the barriers that we're creating to housing and ways that we can cut some of those barriers like minimum lot size requirements and, and other changes that we can make that allow for more types of housing to be built in more places in our community. And then we need to invest in our neighborhoods and existing housing stock so that we don't lose those units and we don't lose those affordable units. And, and, and we're, uh, thank you. Uh, I will though ask the same follow-up question. Uh, what help could be there uh, for people that are struggling now? Yeah, it, I mean, one of the things that we did and one of the things that, that is important to do uh, is you know, when we had American Rescue Plan Act dollars, we used some of that for rent relief. There were dollars that the federal government uh, had allocated to the state of Iowa that we left on the table that we worked to partner with folks like Impact to, to provide additional access. So if we have opportunities, we need to draw down federal dollars. We, we can't be sending dollars back and we need to use that to, to help folks immediately and as much as we can. And uh, Mr. Von Arx, what would you do to help people be able to afford to live and, and how would you pay for your plan? Well, for starters, I think it'd be interesting to entertain the idea of uh, quit paying money into the federal government. I mean, that's nothing that I could really do as mayor, but I could get a whole bunch of other politicians maybe on board with quit paying into the federal government for a little while. So then we'd have a lot more money that, that everybody would have more of to, to make more housing and, and all that. Okay, anything that comes to mind as far as what immediately you would do? Um, well, I, I guess cut down on uh, zoning, uh, the, the, the cost and, and requirements for zoning. I would make it easier for like architects and, and building developers to, to go about their business building buildings for that stuff. Okay, thank you. As Des Moines grows, it is becoming more diverse. Uh, does the mayor have a role in making sure that marginalized groups are protected? We start with you, Mr. Mandelbaum. I, absolutely. I mean, we can't be the community that I want Des Moines to be unless we're welcoming, inclusive, where we accept everyone for who they are, and where your leaders share your values, stand up for your rights, and, and fight for your rights. And there are a number of ways that we can do that, whether that be standing up for our LGBTQ community uh, when their rights are under attack, uh, to standing up for reproductive freedom. In fact, I proposed uh, at the local level uh, things that we could do to stand up for reproductive freedom. There are things that communities in uh, other states have already done, 
And there are things that we can and should do to protect our residents, to stand up for our residents, to fight for our residents. And I'm willing to work with anyone on the council on any one of the four policy pieces that I identified because our residents deserve it. And we need to stand up on issue after issue uh, to make sure that Des Moines is welcoming, inclusive, and where people's rights are protected. It, talk about the reproductive freedoms. What protections you could offer as mayor that then don't violate state law? Yeah, so there, there were four pieces that I identified. The first piece was that we can advocate for codification of abortion access in state and federal law. And if we had passed that when I, when I first proposed it, we would have registered against the six-week abortion ban that was passed in that special session, and we would have used our voice there. If our employees lose access to care, we can provide a travel benefit so that our employees can continue to get access to the same care that they enjoy today under the law. The third piece is we can develop a policy proposal, and I worked with Planned Parenthood specifically on this, to identify and to specifically say that we will not use city resources to investigate, collect information, or surveil a woman or her healthcare provider. And the final piece is we can add reproductive freedom to our civil rights ordinance so that, so that someone cannot be fired or denied housing because of reproductive healthcare choices that they've made. Those are all things within the control of a local government. They're all things that other local governments around this country have done, and they're things that we should do to stand up for and protect our residents. Right. Thank you, Mr. Man Mr. Mandelbaum. Mr. Va Von Arks, what, uh, as mayor, would the role be to ensure that vulnerable po populations are protected? Um, well, I, I suppose, for starters, informing them that there's always going to be people that disagree with them, but also there is the First Amendment right where you have a right to say and express yourself however you want to as long as it's not harmful to anybody. Um, yeah. Um, there's, there's really nothing I can really do about it other than just st saying that the First Amendment covers your right to say, do, and kind of be whatever you want to. Are there policies that you would like to institute to protect, add, add more protections for people? Um, I think just like creating more awareness in general. I don't, I don't really know about policies, but I think like people around the age of 18 should have like more access to information like that. I don't, I, th I think that children should be kind of kept out of the picture when it comes to a lot of uh, issues like whether they can be a male or a female if they're born biologically um, the opposite. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Von Arks. Mrs. Bozen, as mayor, is there a role in protecting uh, marginalized groups? Well, I think absolutely. We need to advocate and make sure that we make clear that we are welcoming for everyone, no matter who you are. Uh, I think that the, some of the bills have been passed, like the LGBTQ bills and all of the bills for the transgender, I have done a disservice to the state. I think it's uh, impacted people that I know that have moved out of state, and that's just not what we want to be, especially as a city. In regards to abortion rights, I'm 100% supportive of the woman's choice, and that it's really the decision needs to be between the woman and her doctor. And some of the things that were being proposed, we did not believe belonged at the city council table, nor that we could impact. Some of the things were a defined benefit that you would have to negotiate, and, but to think that we don't support advocating and supporting women's rights, I think is not correct. Uh, the other thing is our immigrant population. Uh, we, I have met with many of the different immigrant populations of what are we doing to help them. Uh, I know that they get settled in Des Moines and they have three months and then it's kind of you're on your own in a way. Uh, so I've been working with Polk County in creating a welcoming center as a one-stop uh, shop where they will have opportunity. It's in the planning process, but after you meet with some of the groups like I did just recently, the issues they're facing too as gar regards to uh, opportunities for employment, transportation, housing, 
they're compounded when you don't know the language. So I think there's things that we as American advocate and we should do to make sure that everybody feels welcome and inclusive into this city. Right. Thank you, Mrs. Bozen. And this debate is just getting started. We have a whole lot more coming up in the second half hour. That's right. You're watching a KCCI Commitment 2023 special presentation, Des Moines Mayoral Debate. We'll be right back. And welcome back to start our second half hour of the Des Moines mayoral debate. We're going to ask questions specific to each candidate. We'll start with Mr. Uh, Von Arks. Uh, the Des Moines Register uh, conversation that, that you had, you told them that you're tired of excuses from multi-term politicians and their lack of action. How do you plan to do things better? Well, I plan to tell people very specifically what I'm going to do so that people hold me accountable. And I mean, I'm not gonna, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just gonna tell people very specifically what I'm gonna do so people hold me accountable to, to do that stuff. Because ultimately, it's not my goal just to get elected, it's my goal to make people happy. Because if other people are happy, I'll be happy for the same reasons they are. Okay. And I can, I think that I can make more people happy in politics than I could do anything else. Well, maybe music. So, there. Thank you, Mr. Von Arks. Mrs. Bozen, you're a strong schools, we all know, draw families to communities. Uh, you were on the school board for 14 years here in Des Moines. Does the mayor have a role in helping strengthen Des Moines public schools? Um, the district has been losing students uh, and declining enrollment for years. Well, yes, they do. And I, uh, of course, with my background and school board background, I will be a huge advocate for the public schools. And in fact, some, uh, I've heard some of the numbers might be more positive than people think as far en as enrollment. I, have, I came into my whole community service because of schools. I was a PTA president at my daughter's school, helped with a one cent a local option sales tax to improve infrastructure for the schools, and got involved and saw that neighborhoods were declining and we saw a lack of development. And I saw that schools were critical to a neighborhood, but then in the reverse, the neighborhoods were critical to schools. We needed strong neighborhoods to make strong schools. And I decided to run for city council because I thought I could bring that perspective to the city council. I'm a huge proponent of supporting our schools. In fact, we were able to get $4 million in preschool funding out of our ARPA dollars. There'll be six new preschool classrooms with a wraparound daycare component added this fall. And it's a huge opportunity. It's an academic issue and it's an economic issue. All right, thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Mr. Mandelbaum, you say you want to grow Des Moines by supporting working families and making childcare, healthcare, and grocery stores more accessible. What do you think is the first step toward making that a reality? So making a more accessible community is key. We need to invest in the places that are most accessible, our transit corridors, 
And we need a strong and robust public transit system to be the type of community we want to be. We need a strong transit system if we're going to get folks by choice, people who want to live without a car. But even more importantly, if we're going to serve folks who don't have access to a car. 60% of the folks who ride DART don't have a car in their household. And this community doesn't work with them if, if they don't have access to strong transit so they can get to a job, so they can get to childcare, so they can access healthcare. So foundationally, it's a strong transit system and it's investing in the things that, that we need to do to, to connect people to jobs, to healthcare, to childcare. Okay, thank you. So each of you lives in a different part of the city. Uh, we want to know how that would influence your approach to the job of mayor. Uh, Mrs. Bozen, we begin with you. You live on Des Moines East Side. Uh, how would that um, influence your approach to the job? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I, I have been on the East Side all of my life, that I've been in Des Moines. And I think it gives you a different aspect of where you see need and new development. Uh, I also serve at large. So I have served at large through school board and city council. So I've been able, I've had the opportunity to see all the needs. And there's distinct differences between each neighborhood. And it gives me even more uh, desire to get out there and make sure that we're covering every neighborhood adequately and appropriately and giving every neighborhood an opportunity to build up those business nodes. We see the investment when we do that. We see it going down 6th Avenue. We see it in the Highland Park area. Again, having small businesses come in, redevelop an area that had been downturning. And it's, everybody's talking about it now. It's like the East Village 20 years ago. That didn't exist. And we see the growth of those. So for me, from the East side, I get to see all perspectives. And I see a side that we do need more attention on. But we, I know that there's possibilities because I see it being done in other parts. Right. Thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Mr. Mandelbaum, you live on the city's west side. How would that influence your role in mayor? So I, I, I live on the west side. Part of why I live in the neighborhood I do uh, is that where, where I live is one of the more accessible parts of the community. Uh, now I live just a couple blocks from Zanzibar's coffee shop. I can walk there for, for meetings in the morning. Uh, and, and the, um, on the weekends, my, my kids and I and my wife will, will walk to Gusto Pizza. It's an accessible place uh, and that informs part of what, what I see, because I want to create that same type of accessibility all over our community. And while I may live on the west side now, my family has history all over this community. You know, my mom's side of the family is a family of grocers. So my great grandpa on my mom's side had a, one of those grocery stores that was uh, kind of a live workspace is what we'd call it today, but it was a grocery storefront and their, their family living space was in the back of that store. My, my grandpa, so my great grandpa's son, he had a corner grocery store in Beaverdale that he opened when he came back from World War II. And it's that type of accessibility that we've had and that we've lost in this community that I wanna build back everywhere in our community using the model that, that I've seen firsthand and that I've loved where I live. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Mr. Von Arx, you live in downtown Des Moines. How would that influence uh, you in the role of mayor? Well. As well as living downtown, I work downtown as a security officer at all sorts of uh, locations. So I have seen all sorts of issues such as homelessness and crazy, all kinds of crazy stuff I've seen. And it, 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 I've seen it like it's homelessness is not a myth, it's, it's a real problem and the, the city has a terrible scent to it in some areas. And I think that uh, that the city needs to approve, improve upon that and needs to be beautified. I think, I think, uh, and, and also that, uh, that, this, that the stoplights need to have sensors in them. So when there are no cars uh, present, it will be green. So people can just drive through without wa wasting their brake pads. Uh, in specific, what would you like to see the city do? Uh, what would you do as mayor to, to support the homeless population? Uh, I think that, I think that like if, if a, a patch of land was rented, 
a big patch of land. They could they could put up a uh, some some uh, medical teams could set up a bunch of tents and then get all the homeless people to get it, maybe get on buses or something and bring them all down to this this area where they can get all sorts of treatment uh, that, that a lot of homeless people would have. I worked in an ER um, where there was it was just filled with homeless people just because they did, they did it wasn't because they they broke their arm or something it was it was usually because they just didn't have a place to go so there was other families that that were there that weren't homeless that were trying to get treatment for stuff from like a family doctor and you know family doctors are meant to treat families they're not really like as equipped in the specialty of uh, treating homeless and the mental issues that goes along with a lot of a lot of those people so I think if they had a whole bunch of psychiatrists and psychologists down like in an area where they had a bunch of tents they could they could get all the care it, it would be exactly like what they would need and they, they could ask the homeless people like maybe there's not anything wrong with some of them so maybe they could just ask them what they would like and try to figure out what that demographic would like. Right. If they don't want to live in a city and follow the rules of a city, they could you know, maybe make them happy by figuring out what they want. And Thank, um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Von Arx. Okay, we're going to turn now to transportation. And actually, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Von Arx, uh, you'll be asked this question first. Uh, what's your vision for the future of transportation in Des Moines when it comes to bikeability and safe and walkable streets as well as traffic flow? Um, well, I think that gas prices are too expensive and um, I think that gas prices are so expensive because they are taxed and that if, if gas prices were lower, a lot of people that ride bike and just walk would probably uh, drive. And I think that if, if we had cars that got a hundred miles to the gallon uh, I think I think that there are cars capabilities uh, where that could be a possibility and I think there needs to be more of that instead of this like big crazy monopoly on gas and uh, uh, fuel engine situations okay thank you uh, we're going to direct this question now to uh, Mrs. Bozen uh, your vision for the future of transportation in Des Moines well, I think we have a lot of work to do uh, to make connect everybody together. One thing I know that Des Moines has a MOVE DSM plan, and it's really to create new road diets, where, as you can see, some of the roads, we've narrowed them down to three lanes. So we can add the bike, the bike lanes in it and make it more safe to ride your bike and also more sidewalks and walking ability, too. So we've made great strides in uh, being able to add on to all of those things, but we have a lot more work to do. And as far as mass transit too, how do we do mass transit in a, a, I think, a different way? I believe we need to look at more of the on-call mo model. Uh, we can't get more riders until we get more routes, and we can't get more routes until we get more riders. And I think we need to look at other alternatives because I think it's critical because people rely on transportation to get around. We need to offer other alternatives than just the four wheels. But I think that we have got a plan and we are implementing it wherever we redo roads. You can see where we're transforming them into uh, a different model where there's more turn lanes. We have a whole study going on Douglas Avenue where we are transforming from all the way down. You can see what happened on 6th Avenue because by redoing the roads and creating more access, and we can now then create more economic development in those areas too. I do want to ask, uh, as far as that's concerned, the construction, what do you say to the business community and, and some people that uh, maybe live near those areas while it's going on. There is some frustration there. I totally agree with them. I drive through it too. But I just say the pain that you're feeling now will be so good. I mean, it will be so good when it gets done because you see the final, final product up on 6th Avenue. It's a beautiful streetscape and it's very accessible with new uh, pavement and much smoother to drive down. Okay. And uh, uh, Mr. Mandelbaum, now we'll uh, direct the question to you. Yeah. We need to create an accessible community for everyone, and that means roads that work for, for folks that drive, but we also need walkable, bikeable, transit accessible community. Uh, that means we need to fill sidewalk gaps. 
And one of the things I was proud to do is I advocated for the sidewalks on Fleur Drive to be included as part of that project. And I've seen families walking from the apartments on the north part of Fleur Drive all the way to the grocery stores multiple blocks south. Those were families that wouldn't necessarily have access to that grocery store, but we made access because we're thinking about everyone who uses that corridor, not just, uh, not just the folks in a car. It's thinking about the role transit plays in our community, because we can't be the type of city that we want to be without a robust transit system for the folks who have no other option. Again, 60% of the folks who use DART have no car in their household. And we need to think about options like that uh, because they serve more than, just, uh, more than just the folks who don't have an option. They serve folks who want that choice too. And when you're uh, talking about the sidewalk improvement projects, uh, how do you decide who gets what when? How that order is decided? Yeah, so there, there, there are two pieces that, that we do to that. One, when we are doing a, a road reconstruction or a road project, we're including that in every project now. We have a policy called complete streets, and when we reconstruct a street, we need to reconstruct it with every user in mind. That means folks who, who walk, folks who bike, and transit users. Uh, and if you redesign a road the right way when you're rebuilding it, it's a more economic way to do that. But then we've also identified and given priority to our sidewalk gaps. There are 600 miles of sidewalk gap in the city of Des Moines. And we've identified what we're calling priority one sidewalk gaps, those sidewalks that connect people to a school or to a transit route uh, are the priority one sidewalk gaps. And we have been funding those priority one sidewalk gaps, although I will say we've not been putting enough funding. It's going to take us almost 30 years to fund all of our priority one sidewalk gaps at the rate that we are funding them today. That's too long for a kid walking to school or someone trying to get to a bus stop so they can get to work. Okay, Mr. Mandelbaum, thank you. And this next question, we begin with you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Uh, does the mayor have a role in addressing climate change? Yes, the, the mayor has a role in addressing climate change. Uh, there are multiple local climate solutions that we can implement. We've talked about some of them. We can make our community more walkable, more bikeable, more transit accessible. That has an impact on climate as well. Uh, but there are a whole range of policies where we can lead. I was proud to lead our effort on the 24-7, 100% clean energy standard that we've adopted as a city. That's become a model standard, not just in the state, but it's being talked about nationally as a way to move the climate conversation forward. Windsor Heights and Waterloo adopted our policy, but, but that's a way that we can lead, as we can come up with new ideas and new policies. One of the, the most significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions in a city is the energy our buildings use. And we have an energy conservation and water conservation ordinance that we can work with buildings to make them more efficient, which is economically beneficial. And when we make houses more efficient, that benefits our residents by lowering utility bills. So there are climate solutions that provide significant additional benefit, and we should lead on those. So there are a lot of options. What's the first thing you do? So the first thing we do, uh, we've been drafting our climate action plan the city of Des Moines is, I think, behind. We don't have a climate action plan in place. We need to pass a climate action plan immediately because every minute we delay, there is significant federal funding available right now through the Inflation Reduction Act, and we should be taking advantage of those opportunities. So the first thing, we pass a climate action plan that provides a roadmap for everything that follows. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. Mr. Von Arks, does the mayor have a role in uh, cli in addressing climate change? If so, what is it? Uh, I don't really think so because I think that's more like along the realms of like science fiction and fantasy. I, I, don't, really, I don't really believe it. You don't believe that the climate is changing? I believe that the weather changes, but, I, but if, if, that has, if it has anything to do with global warming or anything like that, it, that's just science fiction to me. So there's no role whatsoever in, in doing green building or mass transit or anything like that. That wouldn't be something that you would um, well, see as a priority. Uh, um, not, not from a climate standpoint, but like if, if a lot of people want to have uh, more green buildings, 
that would be that'd be okay. I guess that's what the people want. I don't see why not. But I I think it's I think that the science is rooted more in like science fiction than it is like actual fact. Anything you, else you would like to add to that thought? Um, no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Von Arx. Mrs. Bozen, does the mayor have a role in addressing climate change, or is climate change a real thing? Climate change is a real thing, and we do have a role. And I've been proud to uh, support the resolution that we did on our clean energy, and also waiting to. S we've got the first draft, or I think the second draft of our ADAPT DSM, which is a roadmap on how we can do things be beyond just uh, doing the building benchmarking, but it's also how we can do community gardens, it's how we can do things within the community to show our citizens how they can all take a part in it. Uh, it is important that we take a stand on it because we see the ramifications of what's happened to our own community through the floods of 2018 and the derecho and different things that have come about. So it's incumbent that we take every measure and it's really, I say, it's bringing people into the fold. Uh, we see, as I go door to door, rain gardens being put in front yards, cutting back on what people have to mow, more native plants, native grasses, things that we can do to, in our own small way to add on to this. And I think we have to be a leader as a city. And when we're building new buildings, which we are, we put solar, we've completed a solar field for the new greenhouse and the Animal Rescue League building. So I'll ask you the same thing I asked Mr. Mandelbaum. What's the first thing that you would do as mayor in, in regards to this issue? Well, I think it's lead by example and make sure that every one of our buildings is up to what it needs to be. Uh, I go back to, like, in, we have Energy Star rating that when I was on the Des Moines School Board, Des Moines got the Energy Star rating because of Des Moines schools and the efforts we did on retrofitting all of our buildings to make them more energy efficient saving millions of dollars then went back into education. So I think it was a roadmap. I think we as a city are doing much more. And we have to thank our uh, Frank County, our mayor, who has made a national or international statement for us as the city of Des Moines. In updating the city buildings to um, the, the status that you were talking about, that's a significant cost. Where does that money come from? Well, I think we're already doing that. We've okay. already got, like, different buildings are already LEED certified. So I think that that's within when you're retrofitting anything or having to make normal repairs, you get to the most energy efficient that you can do. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Uh, finally today, we are giving each candidate the opportunity to share a closing statement. Each candidate will have 45 seconds. We drew names out of a hat to determine the order, and we'll begin with Mrs. Bozen. You have 45 seconds. Well, I'm running for mayor because I believe we need a mayor that can bring about change and do so in a way that can bring everybody together. We have had great things going on in Des Moines, but we still have significant challenges. And I'm prepared to tackle those in regards to economic development, public safety, infrastructure needs, and revitalization of our neighborhoods. I have a track record of getting things done. I have shown that if you bring people together, you can come up with creative solutions. This is our opportunity for the first time in 20 years to have a new mayor. And, and actually, it could be our opportunity in almost 200 years to have the first woman mayor. I am committed to this. I, community. I care about this community and I will do the work that it takes to get the results that we need for the betterment of all of our citizens. Thank you, Mrs. Bozen. Mr. Von Arx, you now have 45 seconds for your closing statement. Uh, for my closing statement, uh, I'm running for mayor not because I aspire to be a politician. I am a musician and it's just a little bit hard to follow a music career and so I'll, what I'll be doing to campaign is having concert rallies where I'll be playing music and giving speeches. There'll be other speakers there and whatnot. And if you have ailments or whatever and you want uh, to try some uh, uh, alternative healing methods, we'll, we'll have people that'll uh, cure your ailments. Because I think that, uh, that, 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 that in healthcare, they, Healthcare offers medication and, and psychiatry and, and that stuff. But I think that there's also like some homeopathic remedies for, for things that I, I, I'd like to bring to the forefront of public consciousness. Okay, uh, Mr. Von Arx, thank you very much. 
And Mr. Mandelbaum, you have 45 seconds to make your closing statements. This election is about our collective future. Uh, and it's something that I think about every single day. I started my day today dropping my seven and nine-year-old off at, at school. And I think about their future and the kids who are also in that drop-off line are walking to that school. I think about when they're 17 and 19, 10 years from now, what kind of community will we have created? And I want to be part of creating a community that when we look back at it, they can look and as they make their choices, they can say, this is a community that I want to be a part of, that I want to stay in, that I want to raise my family in. That's what this election is about. It's about creating a community that works for everyone, provides opportunity to everyone, and that people are going to choose to be in and choose to stay in. That's why I've outlined my vision for Generation Des Moines, and I hope you'll join me and be a part of this campaign and be a part of creating a future that works for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mandelbaum. We want to thank the three candidates for participating today, Connie Bozen, Josh Mandelbaum, and Christopher Von Ox. And this concludes our KCCI Commitment 2023 special presentation of the Des Moines mayoral debate. But our coverage of the race will continue through November 7th until a winner is declared. Make sure to stay with KCCI 8 News in the weeks ahead and on election night. And we hope you found today's debate helpful and informative as you make your decision. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.